I was talking to a customer the other day and he asked me how a bleed valve actually works. Now he's got one on his car, he knows how to install it and adjust it and what it does, but he was curious about what's inside it. So I thought this is a great opportunity to take one of these things, cut it open and show you what's inside. Now it's important to use the right tool for the job. Now I'm not the right tool, so I'm going to give it to Ryan. So Ryan's going to put this boost controller in our vertical mill here, take a few passes off the top of it so we can open up and see the valve mechanism inside. So here's the bleed valve that Ryan's cut open for us. So you can get a good look here at what's inside. Now it looks quite basic, but the main thing about these bleed valves is that as long as they're machined precisely, it means you get accurate and reliable boost adjustment and control. So here's what happens. The boost pressure comes in through this nipple here. You can see there's a tiny little restrictor hole just there. Now I'll come back to that purpose later, but at the moment we'll keep going through the overview. On the other side, we've got the other nipple that goes to the wastegate actuator. Up here, we have the adjustment screw, which is a tapered needle. It's basically called a needle valve. The reason for the taper is that it makes the adjustments very fine and precise. So as you put your adjustment tool in the top here and you turn this screw, this moves up and down and it opens up this passage here. So we've got boost pressure coming in through here. It goes into this chamber, straight out through to the wastegate actuator, but here's where the bleed part comes in. You have this vertical passage which leads up to the adjustment screw. So as you move this screw further out, it opens up this passage, lets the air bleed out through these two holes. And basically what that is doing is reducing the amount of pressure that gets to the wastegate actuator. So you may have 15 PSI coming in here. You might only end up with five or 10 PSI actually getting to the wastegate actuator and that is how you increase the boost pressure. The less amount of pressure that gets to the wastegate actuator, the more boost you get. So let's go back to the purpose of this restricting hole. The reason it's there is it actually needs to restrict the amount of air coming into the whole system so that the bleed screw has a chance to evacuate the pressure. If that restrictor weren't there, the turbo would be able to fill this chamber faster than the bleed screw can let it out. So effectively, you'd be, you'd be turning the screw, you'd adjust it further, and nothing would happen because these holes just can't flow enough air to compensate for the amount of air that the turbo can pump into this whole system here. So by restricting the flow, it gives this bleed screw more sensitivity and more ability to reduce the pressure that gets to the wastegate. Now the diameter of the restrictor hole is quite important. It changes how sensitive the adjustment screw is and it can also change the spool rate of the turbo. If you make this hole too small, what can happen is it delays the signal that gets to the wastegate actuator, which can lead to boost spiking. The diameter of the restrictor hole also changes the sensitivity of the adjustment screw. The larger that hole, the less sensitive this screw is because you need to bleed more air to compensate for how much is coming in. If you go too small, it can actually make the adjustment screw too sensitive, which can lead to boost instability and generally unreliable boost pressure control. Now there is one more type of manual bleed valve that I want to talk about, generally known as a ball and spring system. So here we have ball and a spring. Now the idea of this system is that the ball and spring is supposed to stop the boost pressure getting to the wastegate actuator until the boost gets a bit higher. So the idea being is that it helps the turbo spool up faster. The only problem is, in practice, this spring is usually not strong enough to hold back much boost pressure. It may only be one or two psi, so the end result is not, doesn't have a great effect on the amount of spooler. Now the second point I want to make about this is that because the restrictor is such a critical part of the performance of the bleed valve, putting a moving object behind it is not really a great idea. What we find is that you get boost instability and boost variations because when the ball comes off its seat, it's not always in exactly the same place. Now in fact, if you were to actually pressurise that, you may even hear the ball buzzing around and vibrating on the seat. And as a result, back here at the wastegate actuator, you can actually see the boost pressure oscillating a little bit and vibrating with the ball. Now the GFB bleed valve doesn't use the ball and spring system for these very reasons. We prefer to use a properly sized restrictor hole, which gives us good control and sensitivity, which results in better boost stability. So there's a bleed valve dissected. You can see how a simple device can perform such an important job as controlling your boost pressure.